Last I checked, when the present takes on the future, the future usually wins. Let's see if we can't figure out through all that change, all that chaos, all that complexity, where the market opportunities are. Peter Shia. Peter, Peter Shia. is known internationally. Helping companies create new value at enterprise scale. We all know what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to do more with less efficiency. We're going to have to respond and evolve agility. We're going to have to add more business value. A staff in 23 cities. He's the founder of Kerakins Group, a global consultancy firm focused on catalyzing growth in companies around the I'm world. I'm a successful so entrepreneur. How to get massive results the... faster than you ever thought possible. I've had the honor of seeing some of your material, but nothing beats the live experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Sheehan! Man, do you remember the good old days? You've not seen this behavior ever, right? Companies that elevated themselves above the competition in chaotic markets and took chaos and created opportunity instead of taking chaos and creating chaos were the ones that refused to believe that the external circumstances drove their internal success. They fundamentally believed that they had the ability to create their future. I want you to imagine you own the technology, you own the brand, you dominate distribution, and then you own the content that goes on the devices. And now I want you to imagine you missed the biggest market opportunity in 50 years. Clearly, I was long in Sony stock, and I haven't quite recovered from that experience <laughs> yet. The problem was not that we didn't see the future. The problem was that nobody at Sony talked to each other anymore. He said, the more the market changes and disrupted, the more the opportunity is in the cracks. The money gets made here during times of change, and the job of the leader is not to sit above it, but to be the glue that brings all of our capability together. Because your consumer does not care how you're structured in an omni-channel world. It's the ability for our customer to buy our product if they just wait three weeks for 25% less than they get it in store, and we're still 100% committed to a bricks and mortar retail strategy. That's the problem she had to solve. Listen to what they did. If you take the jacket off the hanger, the two flat screens closest change their imagery. The first one shows you the artisan making the garment, because if you're gonna spend two and a half grand on a raincoat, you better have a really good justification for that irrational spend. End, all right? People who have grown up to be really good with a hammer tend to think every new opportunity is a nail. They try and shoehorn the new future into the old go-to-market model, when what they really need to do is evolve the model. And what Burberry have gone on to do is build the most powerful CRM engine in luxury goods, and it was inspired by this risk they took by moving into the very thing that disrupted them the most. You're in an accident. It's not that bad, but you're bleeding. You've called the paramedics, the ambulance, you've called the police, you're waiting for them to arrive. But what you don't know is that your accelerometer automatically notified the progressive claims assessor in his little white truck, and he beats the paramedic to the accident site. He's like, dude, I can't help you with your head, but here's a check to replace your vehicle. Get your teams aligned behind efficiency. Don't fight it, don't defend against it. This pressure to do more with less is not going away. Don't like freak out about it. It's like getting stung to death by the same bee. It's just gonna keep coming back. Go with it. And the two things you wanna do and get people focused on is number one, don't get attached to your role, don't get attached to the particular process, don't get attached to the platform that you use. Get attached to the outcome. That's point number one. Point number two is when you start thinking about that outcome, we're gonna talk a lot about outcomes in a bit, put the customer right in the center of that and then work your way out because you could find ways to deliver better support and create a better customer outcome and spend less money doing it. You can't out Amazon, Amazon. You can't out Walmart, Walmart. Great companies know exactly how they're gonna win and then they put every single dollar they have and every single time unit they have to invest in amplifying that value proposition. And they're saying, you know what, we're not gonna play over there. That's not our space. This is our space, but we know in order to win, we have to be this good. And then you begin this upward spiral of innovation and margin creation, by the way, as well.
you see over and over and over again, business is facing complexity. So what people do is they run harder and harder and faster and faster. And as the sales cycles get longer and longer, they try and fill the pipeline quicker and quicker. No, what Adobe did was, let's not just work hard, let's do the hard work. And the ultimate problem a marketer has, which is the vast majority of their clients, is not how do I make pretty images? The actual problem is half my marketing works. I just don't know which half. So let's solve the higher order problem for the customer, which is we're going to help you figure out which half of your marketing works so you can double that spend and kill the other. Having the management risk appetite to learn about that and lean into that complexity is where you create differentiated solutions. You go through simplistic, past complexity and too simple, and you use that insight, you use that vision of the future, you use that intellect to get you deeper with the relationships you have with your client, where you're not just thinking about you and them, but you're thinking about the entire value chain, understanding the user experience, building intimacy, elevating yourself above the RFP process into this strategic trusted partner, and then you take that to solve the real problems, not today's problems, but tomorrow's problems, and you focus on the outcome, and you're willing to get creative in your model, in how you go to market, how you engage to get the outcome, irrespective of your historical inputs. The biggest problem in times of change and transformation or the unwillingness of an organization to adapt is when an individual in a position of power has a personal attachment to how things get done. And they hold on to that attachment and don't move with the times, change with the technology, adopt new practices because their ego is attached. Their identity is attached to a certain way of doing things. He put it differently, he said, where there is ego, there is excess. Organizational transformation is not about big decisions, it's about the accumulation of aligned, smaller decisions that stack up to the bigger vision. The organizational decision is merely the promise of value and that actually the realization of value sits in the individual decisions that tens of thousands of people make every single day. At some point we've got to stop talking about what has to change and start focusing almost exclusively on how we're going to get people to go on the journey. Let go of the legacy belief systems and reimagine the future in a form of possibility. Don't change because it's going to hurt if you don't. Change because it'd be magnificent if you do.